very much. I'm thrilled to be here. I will try to finish within 15 minutes so I don't get whacked with that five-minute board that she's got over there. So I'm going to really talk a little bit about this treehouse, which is a 497-bed residence hall for students at the Mass College of Art and Design in Boston along the Avenue of the Arts. And I'm going to start by giving you a kind of framework about how we were thinking about this project and how our office has been thinking about color and warmth in modern buildings. Our design process I'll go through very quickly, um, and then I will talk about the delivery method, how we documented a rather organic shape um, with a lot of small metal panels um, into the finished project, and then I'll end with some project images. So to start, it was wonderful to work with students at MassArt. It reminded um, our team that as children, and most of us in this room as architects, um, uh, we're really fascinated with color and with painting and with art. But as we grew and we matured and we became trained as architects, our fascination with color and warmth disappeared a little bit. And we were taught that different things were beautiful. The home of modernism, we are sitting in it right here. Boston has not been so receptive to modernism over the past years. So we're showing you, I'm going to show you a different way that we have been thinking about how to recapture um, some of the beauty and exuberance of things that we've all known uh, in the past, particularly uh, from architects who would both collaborate and invite um, participation in the design of their buildings. Um, these images, Santorini in the bottom left, uh, is, is, are some of my favorite images because they show the beauty of nature on the one hand and the beauty of the artificial and what the urban fabric could be on the other hand. And think about that one in Santorini on the left for a moment because in the next century, the people in this room, architects and developers, are going to have designed more cities than in any other point in human history. So if we asked the people who are going to occupy those cities, what would they prefer? Would they prefer Santorini or would they prefer this? Um, I think you can gauge that they might prefer a higher version of Santorini. Um, this image came to mind because at our very first community meeting for the Massachusetts uh, College of Art and Design Residence Hall, a member, a really outspoken member of the community said, I'm going to ask you two questions. The first, why do architects have a fetish for green and gray glass buildings? And then the second was, you're not going to do that here, are you? So, so that was an easy one to answer on the spot, right? He, I'm not sure what he thinks of what we gave him as opposed to this, but it was an easy one to answer on the spot. So in terms of our design process, uh, we're a firm that has about 200 people with offices in Boston and Miami. And our teams, like most offices, change from five-person teams to 20-person teams. Our design pyramid um, is not the traditional pyramid, I, I think. We try to purposely compress that pyramid from this to this so that we have a broader base of input, a higher level of kind of creative juices flowing on every single project, and that can include the clients and everyone else. We work with a Venn diagram that has the concept emerging from the center of really the best creative ideas, not just operational ideas that our clients can provide, also, the kind of latent energy of whatever the context is, and then we're always searching for something joyous to add um, to the project. And for the mass art project, the symbolism of the tree of life emerged as a concept that we would use as a vehicle to explore things in architecture that we, would not, we probably wouldn't have done just as an architecture firm. Um, the context is the Avenue of the Arts in the city of Boston. So the Avenue of the Arts was renamed Street. It is where the Museum of Fine Arts sits, the Museum School sits, Mass College of Arts sits, a lot of universities sit along this. Unfortunately for Mass Art, they occupied, their, they are the first and only really public freestanding art school in the country. Uh, they started around 1890, um, and they've moved from campus to campus, and they ended up occupying what is not lovingly referred to as the Darth Vader building in the bottom left. Um, sometimes it's referred to as the building who shall not be named. So our site was diagonally across from that site, so we had this tale of two towers going on, and we wanted to get a good sense from everybody what they preferred. So we conducted a number of very large meetings with 
uh, adjoining universities with the public, with the community, with faculty, with students, 85-person charrettes, well-structured, that always had three options to every solution or to every problem so that there wasn't a dialectic. Um, and out of those charrettes became this real yearning of the students to be recognized along the avenue of the arts for the engine of art that they were. Um, and then out of that, we came up with this concept of the tree of life as a symbol of growth, change, and rebirth for both the city of Boston and the, and the college. Um, and we used Klimt's painting from 1909, which really availed itself to us, not just because of the warmth of the imagery, but also because of Klimt's technique of putting slightly contrasting colors next to one another in small amounts to provide a real richness and depth to his work. Um, as I said before, we used this as a, as a vehicle to move forward, and we presented it to the mayor of Boston, who's fairly conservative, but in this case, he said, you know, you're in art school on the Avenue of the Arts. I guess you should look like one. Um, he did say, I guess. I mean, in the end, he loves the building, but it took some doing. And th this shows some of the images that we started with. The lower left, it, started, it looked a little bit too much like a warm science building. Then we started to shape the building. We did this you know, in steps. We would show the students and the faculty different things. And we were looking for something organic. As far as our facade was concerned, we needed something to be uh, simply sustainable. So we, we opted for a inexpensive, uh, high R value skin. Um, and we wanted it to be lead gold. No gadgets was our directive, again, from the students. No solar panels, no wind turbines, nothing like that. Simple passive. Um, and we used bark as our operating mode to really take us places we hadn't been before. We had seven different types of metal panels in terms of color, uh, five different widths, five different depths, and five different glosses as you went up the facade of the building. So there you can see some of the profiles. Um, and then we used a trick that I guess architects had invented at the turn of the last century to make buildings appear taller. So there was a wonderful building in Boston called the Battery March Building, and that building used 16 colors of brick, dark brown at the base, and it transitioned to gold at the top. And when it was first built, it was freestanding, and it really made the building be perceived as if it was a lot taller than it was. So we employed the same um, approach here, and I'm sitting in front of you here today, so I guess it worked. Um, what we did to, to make it efficient from, a, from an economical point of view, because this is the public art school, was we did a patterned repeat every two stories. So the panel sizes, the window locations are exactly the same, and then we overlaid the different colors on top of that to get to where we needed to go. We worked with our partner, Suffolk Construction, who I think is here today, uh, and their subcontractors. This shows the rain screen metal panel system. We used closed cell uh, spray and insulation in the cavity behind that, and we ended up with an R value of over 20, which was terrific for a high rise building. Each facade was engineered differently in terms of uh, the glazing, and I'll explain that in a moment. We used BIM to produce these schedules. And for the architects in the room, we had 5,900 metal panels, and we had no RFIs on metal panel or steel, primarily because of BIM. And that's RFIs means requests for information. Um, because of lean construction techniques, we cut two months off of the, the building project. And as you could see, uh, for you, those of you who work in Revit, Revit isn't always the easiest design tool. In fact, it's downright ornery most of the time. But as we moved along, we could really work on every level of detail of the building. On the inside of the building, we had a color concept as well, which was the tree standing in a field on a New England day, blue sky at the top, right down to cranberry, bogs in the bottom. And all these kind of metaphors really helped to pull the students and the faculty um, and the public officials uh, along, because it's very difficult, as, as Henry will tell you, to permit things in the city of Boston. And these are images of the skin of the building. We used different glass on the south face of the building, which has the fewest windows clear glass on the north face where there are working studios, different glasses on the east and west facade to, to reduce heat gain. The landscaping done by ground was also very organic um, and provided different types of seating for different amounts of students, 10 person, 50 person, really arrangements at the base of the building to kind of pull you into it. This was the lobby where we commissioned a Mass Art alum to do a blue sky kind of architectural type mural on the right hand side. That was Nicole Chesney. And again, you can see the organic metaphor working its way into every part of the building. 
The part that took me or made me most afraid really was we invited a studio of students, mixed interior designers, architects, to design a portion of the building, the cafe at the entrance to the building. Um, and they did wonderful presentations. We brought them into, an into the office for two months. Um, they came up with a great design. And then we had our Last Supper reenactment at the full-scale model that they built to the table. And because I was the most hesitant, they made me play Judas in the far right. Um, here's an image of that space. It's really a wonderful space, very, very inviting. And again, more images of the building. As you can see it, you can see the gloss changing as it goes up the side of the building. Uh, we were shooting for expressive and exuberant. Um, one of the interesting things about this was we, because of the narrow footprint, it's 50 feet wide by 120 feet long, we were trying to find places to have public space in a high rise. So we brought all the kind of gathering spaces of the occupants in the building up to the third floor so we could leave room for people leaving the building on the ground floor. And this we call the pajama floor. It is the most heavily used floor on the building. And it has all kinds of functions that the students can go down in their pajamas to go do without having to go outside um, or elsewhere in the building. Of course, mass art students go everywhere in the, their pajamas, including to class. Um, and here's some more images of the interior of the building. And you can see it sits fairly nicely within the context of the city, uh, the softly sculpted forms, uh, the warm tones of the surrounding buildings. Uh, you can see we wanted people to see the transparency of uses inside the building as well. And it's supposed to be expressive of an art school, and it's supposed to talk about the culture of art and architecture within the city of Boston. Um, and as you can imagine, there has been a lot of discussion about this gold tree. Um, but what I would like to leave you with is really, again, our own fascination uh, with color. And is there some way that we can have children look at the buildings that we design and be um, as pleased with them as the architects? Thank you very much.